Hi everyone, this is Dr. Sharif Al-Jamal and today I'm going to continue my videos about reinforced concrete design. In this video, I will be talking about designing of reinforced concrete columns and this is part number one. As you know, reinforced concrete columns are usually vertical members that support loads from slabs directly, such uh, like in case of flat plate or flat slab, or it takes a uh, load from uh, beam and transfer it to the foundation, then it goes to the soil, okay? Uh, about loads and columns, usually they are uh, primary compression members. So most of the columns are supporting compression forces. However, also they may resist some bending moment. So like the first case, when you have a column, uh, supporting beams, symmetrical beams from all sides, like as in case of internal columns with uh, same spans from all sides. In this case, it will be mainly compression force. If you have columns at the perimeter, as you can see here, and you have only beam from one side, so in this case, it is expected that this beam will transfer load from the beam to the column because of the rigid con connection between the beam and the column. So you will expect that you have some moment here. And if we have a cross section, it will be only one moment in one axis. And this we call it compression and uniaxial moment. The third case, when you have a column, a corner column, like in this case, so you have a beam from this side, perpendicular beam from the other side, no continuity from the other parts of the building because this is a corner column. So in this case, you expect that you will have two moments, one moment from this beam about the y-axis, and then another moment here, okay, which is this one about the x-axis, and in this case, it will be supporting compression and bi-axial moment, okay? And our uh, goal here is to be able to design columns under compression force only, axial compression, or the second case, when we have compression plus uniaxial moment, and compression plus by axial moment. How to differentiate between reinforced concrete columns and reinforced concrete shear wall? Okay, the code is telling us, us this will depend on uh, the cross section dimension of the column. So if you have the cross section of dimension, the uh, dimension of the columns are H and B, H is the greater side and B is the smaller dimension. So it depends on the ratio between H and B. If the H is less than or equals four times B, so in this case, we can classify this as a column and we'll be designing this according to this video and the coming video part number two. However, if this H is much greater than B, where the H is greater than four B or H over B is greater than four, in this case, this, uh, will be designed as a reinforced concrete uh, wall. And our video here will not, we will not be able to use the equations or the methods that we are using here in this video to design a reinforced concrete shear wall. Okay, about famous shapes of columns. You, in most of the columns that you are going to see, it will be like circular columns or square columns or rectangular columns. Of course, you may have different shapes like uh, hexagonal or like an L shape, or, but in most cases, this is the columns that you are going to face, circular, square, and rectangular. For circular columns, the minimum number of steel bars according to the code is six bars. So if you have a circular column, don't put less than six bars in this column. However, for a square and rectangular column, the minimum will be four bars, which means that you need at least one bar at each corner of the column. Of course, this is the minimum, and you can increase based on the required area of steel reinforcement and also the spacing between the bars. Failure modes of the columns, it depends on the, if this column is a short column, okay, or it is a long column or cylinder column. Okay, we'll see after a few minutes what is the difference between short column and cylinder column. If you have a short column, so usually it will fail by compression or shear failure. Okay, compression something like the first 
one here, the first photo, this one, you have a compression force, of course, and you have a compression failure without having a shear. The shear failure is you have an inclined plan like this and you have a shear failure uh, under the compression force. So you may have this one and this one in case of short columns. However, in long or we call them cylinder columns, uh, they will fail mainly by buckling under the compression force here. And because this is a long column, so you may have a buckling failure, not a compression one or a shear one, like in case of short columns. Okay, let's see also what is the meaning of braced and unbraced columns. Uh, this clause here in the BS code is telling us if the column uh, is uh, the lateral, if the lateral loads are resisted by a type of shear walls or some form of bracing rather than the columns, this will be considered as braced column. Okay, so if you have a building like this one and you have any, here a, a lateral uh, loads, it could be coming from uh, wind usually or earthquakes. So due to these lateral loads, it will affect your building and your building wants to sway. If you have a type of shear wall, which is like this one here, uh, that will resist this horizontal forces, or you have a type of bracing, like if you have a bracing on, on your building like this, so it will be working as a truss that will resist the horizontal forces. In this case, we can consider the columns in this building, like these columns here, these columns here are braced because the lateral forces are taken by the bracing system or the shear walls. If you don't have this, this type of shear walls or bracing in your building, it only consists of columns. So all the horizontal forces here will be carried by the sway of the columns, okay? In this case, we uh, have to consider these columns as unbraced columns, okay? So this is one other classification of columns, braced and unbraced columns, and we'll see why we need this in the coming few slides. Depending upon the layout of the structure, it is possible for the column to be braced or unbraced in both directions. It could be braced in only one direction or in both directions. Like if you have a building like this one, and this is a shear wall here in the y direction, another shear wall here at the other end of the building in the y direction. So in this case, if you have a load in the y direction, you will have this shear wall and this shear wall will be very strong and will support the vertical forces here or the forces in the y direction, uh, if this is y and this is x. So in the columns in this case will be assumed as braced in the y direction. However, if you have a horizontal force on the building from the X direction, so you have shear walls here, but they are not strong in the X direction. And in this case, you will have a sway of the columns and the columns, these columns here in the X direction will be considered as unbraced. So for the same building, you may consider the columns braced in one direction, like in Y direction, as in this case, or uh, unbraced in the X direction, uh, as we can see here. If you have a shear wall, like a square shear wall here, or a re rectangular uh, shear wall, so in this case, this shear wall is strong in both X direction and Y direction. So if you have a force in the X or in the Y direction, it will be carried mainly by the shear wall. And in this case, we can consider the columns are, all the columns are braced in both directions. And the third case, if you have a plan and these are the columns, you don't have any shear walls. So in this case, the, all of these columns will be considered unbraced in both directions. What is the difference between short and cylinder or long columns? Okay. To classify a column as short or cylinder, you need uh, to know uh, the ratio between something called LEX, okay, over H, LEY over B, and to compare it with a value. What is this H and B and LEX and LEY? Okay, let's see from this figure here. If we have a column supporting some beams, okay, 
So you have a clear height here in the x direction. If you assume that this is x axis and this is y axis of the column, okay. So in the x axis here, you have a clear height. We will call it L0x, okay. And from the y direction, you have another height here. It could be different from the L0x if you have different depths of the beam. If this beam is, as you can see here, the edge of the beam here in the x axis is greater than the edge of the beam in the y axis. So the L sub zero y will be greater than L sub zero x, okay? So this is, we call them clear height, okay? This is the clear height. To get this LEX, okay? This LEX, we call it the effective height. The effective height here in the X direction will be, we can get it from something called beta times L0. Beta times L0. L0, as I just explained, it will be the clear height from the bottom surface of the beam to the top surface of the slab or the bottom of the column, okay? So this is the, L uh, node, the clear height. So to get the effective height equals the clear height times something called beta. This beta factor, we will get it from the code and we'll see how to do that within like few minutes. So if this LEX, okay, the effective height in the X direction, which equals beta times L0X, okay, it will be a ratio from this one. It could be less or greater based if, if it's braced or unbraced. So it will be like LEX, uh, L effective in the X direction divided by what? Here, if this is in the X direction, so you divide by the depths of the column in the same X direction. So if this is X axis, so this will be the same height, H parallel to the X. So you divide LEX divided by H or LEY, which equals beta times L0y, it will be a ratio from this value. LEY divided by what? <clears throat> divided by the depth of the column in the same direction of y. So here it will be divided by b. So LEX divided by this distance in x direction, which call it h in this case, or LEY divided by b. This, if this ratio here is less than 15 in case of braced columns, we call this column is a short column. If it is greater than 15, greater than or equal to 15, we call it cylinder or long column. The same, if you have unbraced columns, it will be the same ratios here, but we compare it with 10 instead of 15, okay? So to know about short column or long column, you need to get the effective height in x direction divided by the depth of the column in the h, x direction. And this should be less than 15. Or also LEY divided by B less than 15. If you have a braced column and these ratios are less than 15, we can consider this as a short column. If it is greater than 15, we consider it as a long column. For unbraced, it is the same, but we compare it to 10. Okay. Let's see how to get this L effective. Uh, in the x direction and, in, and also in the y direction. Okay, we have equation 30 in the BS code. It tells us that L effective equals beta times L0. What is L0 here? It is a clear height. And beta is a constant depending on the end connection given in, given in table 319 for case of braced columns or table 320 in case of unbraced the columns. Let's see here what is this, these tables. This table 319, it tells us this is a value of the beta for braced the columns. And you have here end connection at the top of the column and end connection at the bottom of the column. And we have a value of one, two, three, okay? What is this one, two, three about the end connection? We will see it. Also the same here, but table 320, values of beta for unbraced columns, and you have end connection at the top, end connection at the bottom, and the difference between this one and this one here, the end connection here, it could be one, two, three, four. However, here we have only, in case of braced columns, it's only one, two, three. 
Also, you can see that the beta for case of braced columns are uh, the beta is equal or less than one. So the maximum value of beta in case of braced columns is one and goes lower to 0.75. If you have a case one at the top and one at the bottom, so the beta will be 0.75. The worst case in case of braced columns, when you have the end connection at the top is three and the end connection at the bottom is also three. So three with three, you get a value of one for the beta. However, for unbraced columns, all the values are greater than one. So the minimum is 1.2. And, and can increase until 2.2 value, okay? So the question now will be, what is this one, two, three, and four conditions? How to know about these conditions, okay? To do that, we can see it from this part here, and we need to classify this connection here. What is the connection between the beam and the column? If we assume this is a column connected to a beam here, so based on this connection here, we can classify it one or two or three or four. So for the first case here, if you have a beam connected to a column, beam or slab, but the depth of the beam or the slab is greater than the width of the columns. So if here H for the beam is greater than H of the column, this depth is greater than this depth. So we can assume that the beam is uh, making a fixation to the column. So this is like a, a fixed connection. The column here at this point cannot rotate, cannot uh, move. So it will be considered as a fixed connection, totally fixed. And in this case, we consider this one as a condition number one, okay? The same if you have the beam connected to the column, but the edge of the beam is less than the edge of the column. So in this case, we can assume that the beam or the slab here is making partially fixation to the column because the column is bigger. So this smaller beam will not be able to make a full fixation of the column. So this will be called like a partially fixed. And in this case, the column will be able to rotate with like little rotation. Okay, it's not totally fixed, not totally pinned. And this will be condition number two. The third condition when you have the beam is and the columns here, this is a hinge connection between the beam and the column. It means that this connection, this column here can rotate easily, okay? No fixation at all. So if the column, like we can assume the column here as a pin connection in this case, so this column will be able to rotate. And in this case, we can consider it as condition number three. Okay, so you can see based on the fixation, totally fixed condition number one, partially fixed condition number two, not fixed like hinge or pin connection, in this case will be considered as condition number three. The last one, condition number four, when you have an, this is end connection of the column here, this connection is free. It can rotate, it can move, and this is, you will see it in uh, a free end of the column like this one. In this case, we can consider it condition number four. So based on the fixation, fixed, partially fixed condition number two, pin, it will be condition number three, and the free end, it will be condition number four. So based on these conditions here, you will go to table 319, table 320, we get the value of beta if it is braced the column or in unbraced columns, and multiply this by the clear height to get the effective height. Once we get the effective height of the column, we will be able to check if it is a short column or long column based on the ratio of the L effective divided by the H or L effective divided by the B, and it's greater than 15 or less than 15 in case of braced columns, and 10 in case of unbraced columns, okay? How about reinforcement details, okay? About for, for reinforcement of the columns, we have two different types of reinforcement, longitudinal reinforcement, okay, and the other reinforcement here, we call them shear reinforcement or transverse reinforcement, okay, or we call them links, okay. So you have longitudinal reinforcement, you are required to design and to know how many bars and which diameter I'm going to use here for the longitudinal reinforcement, and the same also for the transverse reinforcement for the links or the stirrups. 
uh, what will be the diameter and what will be the spacing between these links. So for the longitudinal reinforcement, again, if you have a square or rectangular column, so the minimum will be four bars. It means one bar at each corner of the column, okay? For circular columns, we need at least a minimum of six longitudinal bars in a case of circular column. What will be the minimum bar size? Okay, the minimum bar size allowed in the columns will be 12 millimeter. So this means you are not allowed to use six millimeter for the longitudinal bars or 10 or eight. Okay, the minimum will be four uh, of a 12 millimeter diameter bars. Okay, this will be the minimum in a column. The minimum is 12 millimeter diameter. Okay. What will be the minimum reinforcement ratio and maximum reinforcement ratio? Okay, we have three cases. Case number A in a vertically cast columns. If you have a columns, in most cases, you cast column in a vertical direction. And in this case, the ASC or the area of the steel in the compression, the compression steel in the column, because most of the, all the columns in the, uh, all the reinforcement in the columns will be compression steel. So in this case, it tells you that the area of the steel reinforcement will be greater than 0.4% of AC, where the AC is the area of the concrete, and the maximum it should be less than 6% of the AC. So it ranges between 0.4%, less than 1%, 0.4%, and to 6% as a maximum value, okay? In case if you have horizontally cast columns like pre Cast the columns. If you are you have a factory and you're casting the columns there in horizontal directions, then you take them and you put them in the side, pre-cast buildings. So in this case, they allow you to increase the maximum to 8% because they are not worried if you are, if you are casting the column in a horizontal direction, so the depth is not that big, so you are not worried about getting voids in the concrete. Okay. But in vertically cast, the minimum is 0.4%, the maximum is 6% according to the PS code. At laps, when you have a connection between the uh, longitudinal bars, you have some bars from one floor, you have to connect with other bars here. So in, at this connection here, it increases the maximum is allowed to be 10% because you have reinforcement from bottom and reinforcement from top. But the values, the important values that you need to know is this is 0.4% and the 6%. What is the minimum spacing of reinforcement? The minimum spacing between these bars here, it should be greater than the H aggregate plus five millimeter, what, where the H aggregate is the maximum size of the coarse aggregate, and we add five millimeter to allow the concrete to go and to fill the whole area of the columns. And the maximum spacing between bars here, is 250, so you cannot uh, make a spacing between the bars greater than 250 millimeter. So if you have a spacing more than 250 millimeter, you have to add other bars here to reduce this spacing to be within the requirement by the code. This is about the longitudinal reinforcement. How about, how about the transverse reinforcement or the links? Okay, we need to know about the size of the link, which is the diameter of the link, and also the spacing between these links, okay? For the size of the links or the diameter, it should be the greater of the following two values. One quarter of the size of the largest longitudinal bar. So if you have a longitudinal bar of 25 millimeter, get the quarter of this value, it will be uh, six point something, 6.25, okay? So the quarter of the size of the largest longitudinal bars. If you have uh, different size of bars, you take the largest bar and get the quarter of that one, and this will be the first value. The second value is six millimeter according to the code, but in practice, a minimum link size of eight millimeter is used. So the minimum will be eight millimeter size, this will be the minimum size of the links, or one quarter of the size of the largest bars. Usually it will be governed by eight millimeters because to exceed this value, you need uh, a bar size here greater than 32 millimeter, 36 or more. To, so the quarter in this case will be greater than eight. But if you have the reinforcement here is 32 millimeter size bars or less, it will be always governed by this eight millimeter uh, size. So usually the size will be eight millimeter. And the second part it will be, what will be the spacing of the links? The spacing of the links is the lesser of 
two values, lesser, not greater. It is lesser of 12 times the bar, uh, the size of the smallest longitudinal bar. So 12 times the smallest longitudinal bar. Okay, if you have a bar size of 12 millimeters, so 12 times 12, it will give you 144. This will be the spacing, this is the first value, or the smallest cross-section dimension of the column. A column H times B, so it will be always B. So you compare between two values. The B of the column, the smaller cross-section, and 12 times the smallest bar diameter, longitudinal bar, 12 times, and the lesser of the two values will govern and will give you the spacing of the length. So usually the length will be eight millimeters spaced at the lesser value from these two values here. Okay, this is about the transverse reinforcement. How to arrange this uh, links in the cross section? Okay, this is showing different cross section of columns with uh, square columns or rectangular columns with different arrangement of links. The code is telling us at least you need to have uh, the bars at the corner to be tied by a link, okay? So you need at each corner here, you need one uh, bar and you need a link to connect all of these parts. So at each corner, you need to tie. Also, it tells you that if you have one bar, intermediate bar here, okay? You don't need to tie this bar if the spacing here is less than 150 millimeter. If the spacing between the tied bar and untied bar here is less than 150 millimeters, the code is allowing you to uh, not using a stirrup or a link at for this bar or tying this bar. But if this spacing is greater than 150, if this distance here is greater than 150, you should tie this bar with an additional link. It could be with this shape here. So in this case, all the bars will be tied by links, okay? Also, the code is not allowing you to use, even if this distance is this 150, you are not allowed to use two bars without tying them, okay? So the maximum is to tie one bar, to leave one bar if the spacing is less than 150. And if you have an additional bar, you have to tie it. So you are allowed only to keep one bar untied. If the spacing between bars are greater than 150, and of course, less than the maximum value of 250, in this case, you have to tie every bar, okay? So if you have a column like a cross section like this one here, and every bar here is tied, it means the spacing here is greater than 150. Because if it is less than 150, you can tie this bar and you leave one bar, you tie another bar, you leave this another part, okay? This bar here, and you tie the last one, okay? If you have a square column with more number of bars here, also you can tie them or not tie them based on the same regulation here. What will be the spacing between the tied bar and the untied bar? If it is less 100 than 150, you are allowed to leave one bar only without tie, and you have to tie the second bar and go on and the same, and you continue on that. Okay, this is the uh, end of uh, our first lecture. It was introduction about uh, designing of reinforced concrete columns according to the British standard. We uh, knew together about short columns, long columns, uh, braced and unbraced detailing of reinforcement. In the coming video, we'll see the design equations of different types of columns. Uh, if the columns are uh, supporting only axial load, and if the columns are supporting axial load and uniaxial moment, or the third case, axial load plus biaxial moment. Thank you, and see you in the coming video, and uh, goodbye.